I would like to turn your attention to the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis is the first book of the Bible. And every time when I study the Bible, I am amazed uh, of its richness, its depth, its profound wisdom. I am studying the Bible for, for several decades already, and I continue to get that sense, sense of awe when I see that this is truly the Word of God. Today's special day is 4th of July, and we already mentioned that, and thank you, Roman, for, for mentioning that in your prayer. And it's, it's very important that we would recognize that God's blessing that we have through this country. And at the same time, it is very important for us to understand what's going on in this country now. And we are <clears throat> being blessed by God to have God's special revelation, God's Word, as a lens through which we can see and we can evaluate everything which, uh, which is around us, every uh, act of human beings and everything, uh, how history develops. My special privilege was to spend in the book of Genesis last two and a half years. At the first service I preached, this is my sermon number 65, And this is the last sermon. And I decided that it would be a great idea to preach this sermon on both services, which would help us not just to see the book of Genesis as a whole, but to see the world through through it, to see and to understand what's going on around us today. And this is very important. We live in a world of spiritual warfare. Everything that we are dealing with is not just human actions. We are in the middle of spiritual activities, and we understand that Satan is very um, active, trying to destroy everything what God is doing. He is actively doing that, trying to lure into sin all human beings in every particular detail, and we see many different sins. Those things could be personal, like somebody is getting angry, or somebody is lying or stealing. Or we can see that uh, different forms of sin in sexual perversion. And we can see that displayed around us in the society in general. But there are some objects which are particular interest for Satan. And this object, the main object, is a worldview ideology. The number one concern for Satan is not sin. Number one concern is ideology out of which sin is growing. And this is what he is doing. He is actively shaping or destroying the worldview, making people to believe lie. As soon as he is successful in that, everything will grow out of that. What we, see go, what, what we see going on in society around us, that's a direct result of that strategic attack, which we see during the last several decades and even centuries. Today, we, we reap the consequences of uh, gradual sliding away in the key elements of understanding of the world. Roman already mentioned in his prayer today that uh, the, the people who established this country, they had several very important truths in mind, or that was the foundation of framework of their worldview. And number one is that God is the ruler of the universe. And number two is that God has his righteous laws. And all of those laws are very important. And this is how they tried to build this country. And in some sense, we still are reaping the fruits of their, that worldview. But our main concern today is that this world is being destroyed. The worldview is being destroyed. We see it once uh, again in every new law that, that is uh, issued in this country. And we see it more and more in different forms of behavior that, that we see around us. And it's not just some single case, it's a system. 
And that system is based on the wrong worldview. This is why the book of Genesis is important. This is why every word in this book is important. This is why we believe not the book of Genesis starting from, the, from chapter 4. We believe the book of Genesis from its first word. Because this book lays the foundation, foundation for our life. And one more concern before we will uh, turn to this book. One more area of concern is that, unfortunately, this washing away the foundation or foundational worldview, unfortunately, it happens slowly, step by step, even in the Christian world. Quite often Christians, they do not see the tendency which starts very deep in the very ideological sense, but they will definitely reap the consequences as soon as they give up foundational truths which are proclaimed in the, in the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis is placed at the beginning, the very beginning of the Bible, not by accident. This happens providentially because God wants us, before we come to the a story of redemption. He wants us to have a right understanding of the world. This is why when Apostle Paul is preaching in, uh, you remember on the Mars Hill in, Af in uh, Athens, he started his sermon not from the gospel. Before teaching these people or revealing them the gospel, he needed to explain them who God is and what purpose he has in this world and why he created human beings, and what is our responsibility before God. This is a necessary truth that, is, uh, that has to be taught to the people before they would be able even to understand the gospel. This is why the book of Genesis is important. This is why I decided to spend this hour, or maybe a little bit less, uh, looking into it looking into the main elements of this book. Of course, the book of Genesis has uh, 50 chapters, and we would, would not be able to go through all of them. But I would like to, to show, to underline four basic elements which we find in this book, which are still very important today. Actually, much more important than we can imagine it. It is, it is foundational. Every of these elements play foundational role in our worldview, in our life, in life of each of us, and in the life of the society in general. So let's look at these four elements. Number one, the book of Genesis communicates to us from the very beginning that God created the world. This simple. This simple truth has tremendous consequences. And one of the major problems that we see in the society around us today is a rejection of this truth. And one of the main problems that we, have, we see in the Christian world today is the forgetting of that truth. Little by little, we are just losing focus or we are looking into something, forgetting the role of God in all of that. When we read the, you know, the Genesis from the very beginning, we see several very important elements that are expressed by Moses, by Holy Spirit through Moses, uh, how God is communicating it to us, letting us know that we would have the right worldview from the very beginning, from the very first world. The number one thing we see here, the world was created by God through His Word. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's a very clear statement that the world around us did not happen by chance. It's not an accident. The world around us, the whole universe, is a product of God, His activity, His initiative, His ideas, His design, His purpose. There was a time when nothing existed besides God. And God decided in His providence, we don't understand full 
uh, number or depth of the reason why God had created the world. We can speculate, we can see that the world is a uh, description or display of His glory. Actually, next sermon, Lord willing, next Sunday, I will preach on this topic uh, as well, about God's glory being displayed through the universe. But we understand that uh, the whole universe, the earth, uh, us, uh, people around us, the nature and everything that we see uh, came into being by God's initiative. So this is God who decided to do that. And it has very practical consequences. It means that this world belongs to God. That's simple. Not to us, not to the people, not to the great nation. This world belongs to us. There are several other consequences, very clear consequences. God is the one who determined the purpose why this world exists. God is the one who de determined the way how this world was created. God is the one who determined the laws and all the structures of this world. And this is something that we people need to keep in mind. This is something that when we keep that in mind, we will have right and prosperous life. That's simple. Very simple words. And this, this statement, which we read in Genesis 1.1, this statement was an object of attacks of human beings from the very beginning. People are not at ease with that. They have in themselves, they have inner claim that this world belongs to them. And they are masters of this world. And they can set up rules and laws here. And they can understand in their own way the purpose of existence. And there is a clash. It's ideological clash. And this clash going on in the world from, the, from its very beginning, from the, the, the fall. And now we see what's going on around us is a direct result of that spiritual warfare, ideological warfare. But he continues here. Let's read a couple of more verses. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. And darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the earth, uh, face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. It is another very important element of creation that we need to understand. God had created the world by His initiative, but He had done that through His Word. And this truth communicates a lot of very important information to us. When we look at the world around us, we understand that this world is full of information. What does it mean? It means that in order for any molecule, any atom to exist, it can exist only in the whole system of physical laws. You probably studied laws of physics, at least tried, attempted in the school. Some of you pre, uh, had more success in that, some maybe less. But at least everyone had tried to do that. And you probably know that there are some people, scientists, who know a lot in the world of physics. And they know a lot of physical laws. And when we uh, try to see at the human institutions, academic institutions, and we see that they compile all, all of that knowledge of those laws. And you probably can imagine how many books with very difficult language and difficult explanation of those physical laws that we, even not, uh, we, we cannot even try to understand them. You have to have an academic mind and very high education to understand that. But when you look at all of that, you understand that all scientists, they did not come even close to full understanding of all physical laws. But you understand that all of those laws had been invaded by God 
prior to existence of the first molecule. So God is full of wisdom. He is so smart that he had created all of that complex system of the laws. And these laws are powerful enough that every molecule, every atom of the universe is directly subjected to those laws. This is what it means, and God said. So the phrase that God said, it has in itself a lot of wisdom. God's word is a very powerful force. It's very organized. It's very detailed. It's very precise. It's very complex. Uh, when you see the complexity of the physical laws, you can understand that the author of those laws is much more complex. He is much more, he has vast mind, vast wisdom. Uh, uh, wisdom. So he's the one who is giving birth to all of that. So this is why These first words of the Bible, first words of the book of Genesis are very clearly communicating to us God is much smarter than us. He is much stronger and powerful than all human beings. And He has right to establish the universe. We don't have enough mind. Even if you collect all minds of all generations, we even don't come close to what God has. This is why God had established the universe. And he is doing it through his word. The evangelist uh, John speaks of this using Greek word logos, which is very important. Uh, John 1, uh, 1 through 4, where it in the beginning was the word, and behind this word is logos in the original. So we can read this. In the beginning was the logos. And the Logos was with with God. And the Logos was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made, made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of man. The Logos, the term Logos, contains the idea of organized and functional active information. So when John is explaining to us how God created the universe, he explained that it's not by chance. He puts into the very terminology idea that God is smart and he is organized and he's producing the world which reflects his nature. And this is a very important thing for us to remember, especially in the day like this, when we see that our country, which was established on the basis of this truth, now is sliding away farther and farther from these foundational elements. So that's one thing. The second thing, the world reflects the order established by God. So when we, we are talking about God created the world, we see that the world was created by God through His Word, and then we see that the, the world reflects certain order. There are several indicators of them in chapter 1, and let me mentioned a couple of them. And God said, it's verse 11, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seeds, and fruit trees bearing fruit in which which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And he repeats it many times. Uh, Verse 12, each according to its kind. Then verse 21, so God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the water swarm according to their kinds and every winged bird uh, bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So there is certain order. God had created that order and all people understand that this is something which, which is not established by American Congress. Not by scientists. There was no body of scientists that came together and they decided, all right, these are dogs. And there could be many different kinds of dogs, but they're still dogs. And these are horses. 
and there could be many different kinds of horses, but horse never would become the dog, and a dog never would become a horse. Why? Because there is a law which is created by God, established by God, and there is no ability of crossing these boundaries. So this is very clear in this very book, in the first page of the book. And this is something which God communicates to us in a very powerful way. When we open the Bible, when we open its first page, He wants us to know that. He wants us to remember that, and He wants that we would, through the lens of that first page, to understand everything in the Bible. And unfortunately, today, the first chapters of Genesis are object of most vicious attacks, even within the Christian world. This is why we understand that as soon as you give up on the first chapter of the Bible, you lose everything. You lose everything. Because Bible presents God as someone who established the world. And He had established that in His own way. And His laws are unchangeable. You cannot have some scientists that could come together around the world and they would decide, all right, we will reorganize God's laws. Let's, let's change the law of gravitation. You understand? It's foolishness. It is foolishness. Why? Because they are not authors of their, those laws. They don't have power to establish any laws of nature. This is why we read the first, first chapter of Genesis and the whole book of Genesis. Number three, what we see here in this first point that God created the world through His Word. The world reflects an order established by God, not by people. And number three, very important, this world demonstrates the goodness of God. When, we re- when you read the chapter 1, Genesis 1, you, you, you see seven times repeated phrase, it was good. Seventh time, in verse 31, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. That's an essential element which communicates to us who God is. So when people today are trying to change God's basic laws, actually what they are doing, they say, we are better than God. When they try to say that man can be a woman and woman can be man, they actually communicate to us, they're trying to convince everybody around us that God had made a mistake. And they are better than God. They are more loving. They understand the world better than God. And that's very important because it had been laid in the foundational element of all our existence that God is good and the way how created the world is good. And this is something which we would accept or reject. There's no middle ground. And this is something very foundational that we need to understand that this is something that we would never give up because this is the very foundation of the whole Christian life. Actually, it's actually the foundation of existence. People who forget that, they undermine their very existence, the ability to exist, which we see it very clearly in the world around us. So that's one element. Very important, you understand that we don't have time to unpack everything here, so, but we, we will we'll dig deep enough to, to have the whole picture. Number one. Second element we see here, that God established the nature of human beings. This is second very important truth which is presented in Genesis. And today, the world's intellectual elites, they are trying to convince us the concept of man and woman is invented by people, and that all of that is relative, and everything is just a social contract construct. But this is not what the Bible teaches us. The Bible is very clear. And number one thing which we see in Scripture that 
men, human beings, were created in the image and likeness of God. This is the key element. So take away God from that picture, and you will lose everything. You will lose the, the whole structure. The whole worldview is falling apart if you take God away as a creator, as a Lord, as someone who established the universe. So what the Bible teaches us, what the book of Genesis communicates to us, Genesis 1.26, we read, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. So God's, God, within his trinity, has a conversation. Actually, not just a conversation, it's a decision. It's some council within the Trinity which they produce, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They are talking to each other. And they say, Let's, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Verse 27, so God created uh, man in his own image, in the image of God he created him. That's an important element. Unlike the rest of creation, humans are created with the ability to consciously communicate with God. There are different levels of creations. But only humans have ability to think, to have emotions. Only humans have ability to evaluate the world around them, to come to conclusions, to make decisions, to act on, those, act on those decisions. Only humans have ability for conscious communication with each other and for conscious communication with God. This is what, what it means, image and likeness of God. So God created, out of all creation, God created human beings as eternal souls who have that ability to talk to God, to understand God to love God, to communicate with Him, to obey Him, or to oppose Him. That's what we see. And this is what belongs to human beings, to all, to every human soul. You know, when we are losing that, we are losing the foundation for everything which happens around us. A right or correct understanding of the nature of human being is a key element to understand social life, to understand the world, to understand the relationship between people. Because as soon as you lose it, you lose the key element of the essence of human being. You know, when people are promoting abortions today, they are doing that because they like it, because that makes their life more convenient. But the principal reason why they came to that possibility was the initial rejection of understanding that every soul, every soul bears in itself image and likeness of God. And everyone who is killing human being has in a, uh, is in a state of direct confrontation with God. So as soon as they lost that, they have no problem with abortions. We can speak about uh, against abortions many times. But un until we change that central element of their understanding of who human beings are, they don't understand the reason why we are against it. So the key problem is not abortion itself, the key problem is rejection of God as one who created human being after his own image and likeness. This is why the book of Genesis is important. And even further, today we're talking about racial or people around us talking about racial injustices, national injustices. But you know that all of that is here in the very, very beginning of the Bible, which, which means that every human being doesn't matter what skin color, what language, what level of education, where they people live. Every human being, they have in themselves image and likeness of God, which makes them 
especially precious in the whole universe. This is why we should love, love every individual. Doesn't matter who they are. Doesn't matter what kind of sin they are sinning with. Because every human being on this earth reflects image and likeness of God. And this is why Jesus is calling us, love your enemies. Because even enemies, they still have, bear in themselves, image and likeness of God. So everything, all sociology is very clearly here. All the deep and uh, complex relationships, they are very clearly here. They're expressed in the first book of, book of the Bible, in the book of Genesis. Another element which is very important, uh, talking about uh, human beings and the nature of human beings and that God established the nature of human beings. God created men and women. This is not the social construct. This is not something that had been invented by people. Uh, I'm, I, I continue to be amazed when, when I see the level of foolishness of people who have many PhDs. Uh, I see it very clearly. Uh, Romans 1, you remember one, uh, Romans chapter 1, when they claim to be wise, but they became fool. Look what's written here. So God created in his own image, in the image of God, he created him male and female, he created them. There are only two kinds of people, male and female. It's very clear. Very clear in the Bible. Men and woman, both created in the image of God, both created with the ability to communicate with God, both, both created as Eternal souls, men and women, they have highest value in the God's system of values. Now, unfortunately, today in today's world, we see direct attack onto this very essential element of our existence. When people are trying to say that this is all invented by, by human beings. When you try to dress uh, a boy into a girl's dress, and you will eventually have a girl. This is how they teach. But this is full. This is full, and we can demonstrate it very easily. You know that human uh, body has approximately, approximately 32 trillion cells. And every human cell has a marker. Not every human cell. Let's be, be more precise. There are red blood cells. They don't have uh, these uh, sex indicators. But everything else, all other cells in your body have a marker. So it trillions, many trillions. And that marker has in itself very clear indicator if it's boy or girl. There is very clear, scientific, demonstrated, proven picture. A woman has two kinds of chromosomes. They, the scientists call them X and X. And the male has different chromosomes, X and Y. So in your body, you have many trillions of cells which reflect X and X or X and Y. And this mark marker is crying out loud, I am a woman or I am a man. And somebody, somebody has to be fool to proclaim otherwise. Because what, what's the definition of foolishness? It's when somebody is saying something which does not correspond to reality. And this is very clear. If a woman has X and X and somebody is looking at X and X and saying, no, this is a male. It's foolishness. Doesn't matter how many PhDs this person has. And you see that everything, all of that is in this book. In the very first chapter. This is why we need not just to know that, 
But we need to have convictions that this is the case. Otherwise, that whole machine, ideological machine, will run us over. This is what they do. This is what they try to establish in this world today, even in this country. And to believe truth will require certain level of ability to stand against that pressure. And this is what it means to be a Christian. Because we believe truth. We believe what God says in a very clear manner. One another element, another element here in this part of uh, chapter 1. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be, be fruitful and multiply. God created male and female not just because he wanted variety, but he created male and female for the special purpose because they together can procreate. That's an amazing thing. And actually, chapter 2 established the order how it should happen. One man, one woman, loving each other, committed to each other for, for the end of the life, and in this environment, they have that special grace from God to procreate. And it's very clearly here in the first chapter, in the first two, two chapters of Genesis. So this is something, those simple phrases in the book of Genesis, they contain in themselves very deep scientific information of how this world is built. Another element in this portion, we need to understand that God has established the nature of human beings. Uh, he created by creating uh, us in the image and likeness of God and creating men and women, male and female, and creating a family. And there is another element which is very important. Uh, we need to mention that God had created us that we would be able to cooperate or work with, with God. That's an amazing thing. You know, everything on earth, actually everything in the universe, obeys God. Uh, everything like physical laws, they are from coming from God. And we see that He is ruling over day and night. And He, he actually, the Colossians, uh, Chris read today from chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, which, which is clearly stating that He holds everything together meaning Christ. Christ holds everything together. So by His power, this universe exists. It's very clear. But God had created human beings with ability to conscientiously obey Him, to become part of His world. Let us read this uh, verse 28 in chapter 1. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion. It's a very interesting thing. Quite often, I look around, and I see that everything which we have here, even in this room, this very building, this pulpit, this guitar, this piano, this iPad that I have, you know that everything came from the earth. It was not dropped to us from, from the moon. Everything came from out of the earth. So God created earth in a very interesting way. He put into the earth a lot of resources. And he had given human beings creative ability, intellectual ability that they would be able to study that, research that, and learn how to use those resources to produce things like that. Years, years ago, I tried to, um, to, uh, to study a little bit uh, electronics, but it was, you, you remember, electronics in the 80s, it was, or in the 70s, it was not electronics in our understanding. Uh, but I don't understand what is in this thing. There are a lot of uh, semiconductors, I believe. There are a lot of stuff. 
which makes it work that I can read here. I actually was able to, to type it on my computer, then transfer it here and open it and in timely manner read and, and understand what's, what's written here. But you know that every cell in this device came out of the earth. And human beings have that ability. Try to dig the earth in your backyard. And try to get from that earth this, this thing. It's not an easy thing. But we know that everything came from that backyard. Not your specific backyard, but, but from some backyard. We understand that this is the case. And another very interesting thing, look, God could give us all the devices at the very beginning. He could create internet, video, all the smartphones and everything, and give Adam and Eve, Cain and Ab Abel and everybody else. But he did not do that, and he has a purpose for that. He wants human beings to become his associates. So he created the world and he buried in this world a lot of stuff and he had given this world to human beings and he says to human beings, now learn to use it. So he is the creator and he made us to be creators, associate creators, creating out of the world what he, he created. The difficulty is that human beings, using those vast resources, using that great mind, human beings started to use it in a way to oppose God. They started to think about themselves as self-sufficient, that they don't need God. And instead of cooperating with God, instead of working together with, with God, they, they became full. They started to use that as soon as they can, are able to do some, something. As soon as they reach a certain level of success, they think, this is me, who God is. And this is the essence of sin. And we come to number three. Third element here in the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis communicates to us, that, to us that God created the world, that God established the nature of human beings. And number three, God shows the horrors of sin. God demonstrates that this is not something innocent when, when human beings, they decide that they will not work with God. They do not want to cooperate, cooperate with God. This is not just bad. This is terribly bad. This is something which is detrimental, which has, which has deadly effect on human beings. This is why God is warning about sin in the very beginning. We read uh, Genesis 2, verses 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. The phrase you shall surely die means absolutely guaranteed day, death in case of disobeying God. So, so God explains that this is how the universe is built. You are human beings, you are capable of making your own decisions. You are capable of creating things. You are capable of studying the universe and using those vast resources for producing something good. But you need to do that in cooperation with me, cooperation with God. And as soon as you will try to do otherwise, you will put yourself in the position where you claim to be the head of the universe. You try to create your own universe with your own laws, and which is more important, with your own purposes. So you try to go against God's established purposes. This is why sin is so awful. This is why sin is so bad. And this is all here. 
And actually, after explaining how first people sinned in, the chap in chapter 3, you remember chapter 3 in Genesis explained it in details, and we don't have time to go into that. Uh, he, he gives us a big picture of terrible consequences of sin. So he warns about sin, and then from chapter 3 and until, ch until chapter 11, he gives us that picture of the very bad consequences of sin. And we need to understand that. You remember the very first problem, uh, first couple, Adam and Eve, they have two sons, and older son, Cain, kills the younger, Abel. Genesis 4, 8, Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. You know what happened? After a human being established himself or herself, established in the position of supreme ruler, uh, the, what they do, they, they put self-interest, self-pleasure, self-assurance, they put into the highest level of, of their value system. And this is why they, they become enemies of God. But the problem is that as soon as human beings are in sin, they are in conflict with each other, not just with God, but with each other as well. And this is very clearly demonstrated here in the Bible, that when human beings are in sin, they inevitably will try to harm each other. They will try to use each other for their own purposes for their own uh, advantages. They will seek to explo uh, for exploiting other people. This is very clear. So after that happened, you remember how quickly human beings are progressing in into sin. You remember when, when Cain called, killed his brother, he had the terrible weight on his conscience of guilt. He understood that guilt, and he was actually crying to God and uh, seeking relief from that guilt. But in fifth generation, after Cain, we read another, uh, another gentleman, uh, his name was Lamech. He, is not, he's, he also kills the individual. And instead of feeling guilty about that, he is glorifying his act, what he had done. So it's just five generations. Read with me uh, chapter 4, verses 23 and 24. Lamech said to his wife, Ada and Zillah, now we see, we see two wives already. We see that, that problem when people are going away from God's design. Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. You wives of Lamech, listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. And this is poetry. This is in poetic language. So he is boasting that he killed another individual. And when we read after that, you know, chapter 5 and chapter 6 give us a picture, then if God would let human beings live in their sin, they will inevitably come to the position where this society would not be able to exist anymore. Look how is, that society was described in chapter 6, after several hundreds of years after Adam and Eve. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight. And the earth was full with violence. This is what happens. Sin never stays in the same position. Since always, sin always will become greater and greater. He will corrupt people. He will corrupt society more and more. And the first humanity had demonstrated that very clearly. Very clearly when God let them go. When God let them exist in their own sinfulness. This is, what, this is their destination. This is the destination of every human being without God. Even the most uh, educated, the most uh, good people with good manners uh, we, we can think of, without God, they will inevitably come to this position. 
And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. You see what happens? All flesh, it came to the point where this, this uh, virus of sin had affected every human individual. And not just being present in every human individual, but it worked its own way in corrupting every human individual. This is why God had to kill the whole humanity with the flood. It's not just God became angry at some point. It's, it's a result of sin within humanity makes the existence of these people, existence of these people unbearable. It's not possible anymore. This is biblical explanation of sin. This is biblical explanation of the major human problem. The, the main problem of all history, the main problem of our society today, it's not social, it's not political, it's not economical, it's spiritual. The main problem is sin within us. And we need to remember that. And we, we need not to be shy about that. This is the truth. Even the whole society around us rejects it. They, they laugh at the, at the very notion of sin. They not just have no concept of sin, but they reject it to, some, to, to, to such a degree that they would laugh at those people who believe that sin exists and sin is the major problem, the main problem. This is why we're talking about the book of Genesis. We're talking about the essence of Genesis. Actually, in Russian, Genesis, the word Genesis can be translated as being, translated as being. So when we say about the essence of Genesis, we can say the essence of our very being. Who we are and what world is. And this is why we need, actually, the idea of Genesis is very clear to being, because Genesis reflects the idea of something coming, the very beginning of something, the essence of something. So when we talk about these problems and we see how God had destroyed the whole world through the flood, uh, God had demonstrated one more element which was very important. He saved the world through one family. And that family was righteous. You remember Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives. So eight souls had been saved. And they had been saved because the Bible proclaims that they had been righteous. They knew God. They worshipped God. They wanted to worship God. And now look at the picture. They are coming out of the ark. There is no the perverted society around them. There is no the whole culture which was godless and which was built on the animosity with God. Four, eight individuals, four couples, wanted to, say, to, to serve God, and they actually, look what they do. Right after they come out of the ark, what they do? They build, in, they build an altar. And they, they worship God, bring sacrifice. But the Bible is very clear that after a little while, after they get some success in developing that land which they had, they had the whole earth. You know, they... Noah actually owned the earth. He did not have a deed, title deed on that, but he actually owned the whole earth. He could use it. And you know what happened after a little while? The Bible is very clear. Bible, the book of Genesis, communicates to us Noah sinned. And his sons had sinned. You know, uh, God saved Noah and his sons in the ark. But with Noah and their sons, within them, you know what survived the flood? Sin. Sin survived the flood. And this is not an accident. It's a demonstration that sin is a very serious thing. And you cannot 
eradicated, just eradicating the, the bad forms of sin. Now, when we are talking about all people around us who are practicing deviations, many different kinds of bad forms of sin, and we think if we will limit them, we would probably have better society. Yeah, it could, it could help for a little while. But human beings are fabrics of sin. And they continue to produce sin. Look at us. We are here. We understand who God is. We understand the, the, the danger of sin. But look at us. We continue to sin. We continue to do something hurting each other. We continue to do something which is offensive to God. Which comes out of our own being. And this is a picture which is written here. Pictured here in a very clear way. This is the basic of the whole worldview, and we need to understand it. This is why we come to the next point. The point number one, God saves people. This is what the book of Genesis is all about. This is the little picture of the whole Bible. God saves people. It is very interesting. When we read chapter 12, we, came, we come now to the point of uh, chapter 11. And now from chapter 12 until the end of this book, and this book has 50 chapters, until the end of this book, we see very clear information, clear preaching, clear proclamation of God's salvation. Look how it starts. First verses of chapter 12. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your uh, kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, I, I will, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and, I, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Note that God is main character here. This is his initiative. Salvation is not our initiative. And this is very clearly here. God has not just created the world. God is the author of our salvation. This is something which had been born in his heart. And the Lord said to Abram, this is his initiative. So Abram came to the Lord, to the Lord and asked him, Lord, save me. Some people th think that the Old Testament is a uh, part of the Bible which communicates the law and New Testament com communicates grace. <laughs> this is wrong. This is a pure demonstration of God's absolutely undeserved grace. And look what's happening here. It's not just God's initiative, but he is saying, I will show you the land. And then he says, I will make you a great nation. It's not something, Abraham, you know, you can do it. Just believe in yourself. Just believe in yourself and together we can conquer the world. That's absolutely different. This is what he is communicating here very clearly. I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you, bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. Everything comes out of God's initiative. And we need to understand that salvation comes from God. And here he explains that through the rest of the book, he explains two basic instruments, how God does it. Instrument number one. God's salvation comes through covenant. It's a very important element. God could, sa could save human beings without saying a word for that. But what he decided to do, he decided to uh, call out Abraham, and he, he organized a special event which was built on the pattern how people at that time were making a covenant with each other. Usually it was done when something very object of, of their agreement or object of their covenant was very serious. 
So they had a ceremony, they had a way how to do that. And God is doing exactly that with Abraham. And his main purpose is to communicate to Abraham and his sons, and sons of his sons, to communicate one specific truth. I will be faithful. He made, he cuts this covenant with one very clear objective. He wants that people would know, I will be faithful. And this is something which we see. Genesis 15, verse 18. On that day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, To your offspring I give this land from the, from the river of Egypt, uh, Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. So that's first element of that covenant, I will give you the land. The second, I will give you many offspring. Uh, Genesis 17, first two verses. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply it you greatly. That's the second element of that covenant. And we read that in verse 3. Then Abraham fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of, of a multitude of nations. And in chapter 22, we read that part of that covenant was a special blessing which would come through special seed, the one of his sons in the future. I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore and your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. This word offspring is also translated, can be translated as seed, in your seed. So there is, there is one specific individual who will come out of you, who will, be, uh, who will be born sometime later, and he would become a source of blessing for the whole earth, for all people on earth. And this is a very important element. You know, through all his life, Abraham knew that God is faithful because he had promised. And then his son, Isaac. Isaac lived by faith that God had, uh, uh, had promised to his father, to Abraham, and he had promised these three things. The land, he had promised the many offsprings, and he had promised a blessing, a specific blessing which would come through one specific son, one specific uh, seed. And then Jacob still believes the same. That's a very important element for us today, because today we are participants of the new covenant. It's not by, and it is not by accident that when God uh, had sent his son Jesus to die for us. Jesus, right before uh, he was arrested, he gathered together his disciples and he had established new covenant and he says, this is a new covenant. You know why he's doing that? That today we can have that foundation of believing that God is faithful. He was faithful to the first covenant when after many years, Abraham has son. When finally they have, Israel becomes a nation, great nation. When finally that promised seed had been born here on earth. That Messiah had come and he took upon himself the sins of the world and he redeemed us. So we see all of that was promised in that covenant and that had been fulfilled by God. So now we, we have new covenant. And that new covenant demonstrates to us that God is faithful. And he had promised that Jesus would come again. And he would 
take us from this earth to the glory of the Father. And He would end all injustices here on this earth. And He would create new heaven and new earth. And this is why we have that firm foundation to believe because of His covenant. So that, that, that's number one, the, the instrument, the first instrument, how God saves people through, through covenants. And then the second one, salvation by faith. This is another element which is communicated very clearly, very clearly in the book of Genesis. Actually, all chapters from chapter 12 to chapter 50, they speak about faith of the forefathers. They speak about faith of the patriarchs. Demonstrated in different ways. Uh, read uh, chapter 15, verses 4 and 6. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. Uh, speaking about Abraham, it's God's, uh, God's uh, conversation with him. This man, <clears throat> and he refers here to Ishmael. This man shall not be your heir. Uh, you very, your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number of the stars, number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. So this is the very first direct statement of the faith of Abraham. This is why he called the father of all believers, all people who have faith. And then we read the faith in action, in his life, in life of his son Isaac, in life of his grandson Jacob, in life of his grand-grandson Joseph. Practical stories. And you know, those men, they had not been perfect. They had their own faults. They had problems. They sinned. They did not have enough faith all the time. But trusting into the God's promises, that was the main characteristic of this man. This is what made them participants of God's covenant. We read about that in a very uh, detailed way, explained in the letter to Hebrews, epistle of he to Hebrews, chapter 11, presents us the picture of faith of this man. Verse 8, by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith he went to live in the land of promise and in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob heirs with him of the same promise. So what he is describing here, he is saying that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they were living out their faith. Their, life, their lives were characterized by faith, by trusting God's promise. Verse 17, by faith, Abraham uh, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who'd, who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his own only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall be your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figurative, figuratively speaking, he did, did receive him back. So it's another demonstration of the faith of Abraham that he knew that God's word is true. Even in that, the very ultimate test of his faith, when God had commanded him that he would offer uh, a sacrifice, his son as a sacrifice, he understood that the God's word is true, that through, the, through Isaac, through Isaac, he will have that offspring. And at the same time, he has another command from God to take Isaac and bring him as an, as an offering. And to reconcile that, he did not know how to reconcile that. He came to the point that probably God will raise him up. He never seen a resurrection. He never seen a person who had been raised up, but he believed 
because he knew that God is true. God cannot lie. That was very clear. Verse 20. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. So Isaac is proclaiming, demonstrating his faith because he sees his sons and he understands that they will have future. And that future is related to the covenant, to the promise. And then by faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, born in worship over the head of his staff. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave direction concerning his bones. So we see the faith as a major driving force of these patriarchs. The patriarchs did not know all the details how God's plan of redemption will be carried out, but they were confident that one of their descendants would one day become a blessing for the whole, whole earth. Now let's sum up everything that we were talking about today. This is something which is very relevant to us. The essence of Genesis. The essence of being. The essence of our life. The essence of the life of people and society around us. Three main truths we need to understand. God is the creator who defines reality. This is the number one point that we need to be not just uh, aware of, but we have to have deep conviction in that. God had created the earth. He owns the world. He defines the reality. Number two, human sin is the main problem, problem of people. This is the main problem of society, main problem of our country, main problem of us. And number four, Salvation is by faith, through participation in, in God's covenant, and it is the main goal of history. You know, when we lived in Soviet Union, we always were taught that the main goal of history is to build the communism. And all people believed in that. They were brainwashed to, to such a degree that they really thought that they would be able to build communism uh, which uh, in their own way for expressing that it would be a fair society, uh, the, the society that would eliminate all injustices and everyone would flourish in that society. And they really believe that they can force the communists, the communists through all the whole, the whole earth. This is what, what they believe. You probably here thought otherwise when, when you, you were thinking about communism. But this is how people live. But we even then, we understood that the main goal of history is not communism. The main goal of history is not to build a strong economy or just society here on earth. The main goal of history is salvation, which can transform human beings and make them, return them back to that position of conscientious participants in God's glorious work. And this is what we are celebrating today. This is what we are confirming today once, once again. When we look at this first book of the Bible. And when we see through that book of the Bible, we see the whole life. We, hear, we see the life of our country. We see our own lives. We'll pray now. And as we will kneel down, I ask you, take time. Say time and in quietness of your heart, pray first of all about yourself. Praise that this truth would not be just somewhere close in your mind, but they would be deep enough into your heart that they would form your convictions. That they would be truly foundation of your life. This is the only way. This is why. The Bible starts with Genesis. And then second, pray about our country. Pray about those people who reject this truth. Pray about them that God would soften their hearts. That they would come back to their senses. 
that they would be able to see this foundational truth which actually determine their very lives. And this is the mission of the church, to pray for people around us. And pray specifically, especially for the Christian world. Pray for the people who call themselves Christians, but they, little by little, they are losing the essence, the essentiality of this truth. They are softening their convictions in this. This is why Christians are losing in, the, in this world today. This is why we need to stay strong in the very foundation of what God is telling us. Let's kneel down and spend some, some time in quiet prayer. Our Lord God, we come before you now <clears throat> with an understanding that we can do it only because of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us on the cross. We thank you, Lord, for making us your sons and daughters. We thank you for forgiving our sins, for making us righteous in your eyes. Thank you, Lord, for this great privilege to be participants of your covenant. Thank you, Lord, for teaching us today about basics of the universe, about basics of very existence of all human beings. Thank you, Lord, for making it very clear in the Bible. Thank you for the book of Genesis, which presents to us clear picture of who we are and what this world is. Thank you, Lord, for revealing yourself to us. And now we can, we can have those convictions. We can have the right worldview. We can have right understanding of right and wrong. Thank you, Lord, for doing it in our lives. And today, Lord, we especially ask your mercy upon ourselves, upon our church, upon Christian world, and upon the country that we live in. You see, Lord, how Satan attacks the very foundation of our faith, of our worldview, which is built on the truth, on your truth. And you see, Lord, how Satan has success in the big portion of this society, of this country. And now, Lord, we ask your blessing and your help and your power. We ask the work of, the, of your Holy Spirit, first of all, in our hearts. Lord, we need you. We need this truth. We need this um, biblical, clear teaching. Uh, be placed deep down into our hearts, into our understanding that we would truly believe in it. That, that we would function out of those convictions. That we would not be afraid, not be intimidated by the people who think otherwise. Who reject you and reject your laws. And reject your order that you had established here on this earth. Help us, Lord, to be strong and courageous Trusting you, following you. Lord, we ask you about the whole Christian world. You see how many people today are intimidated and they are 
actually becoming more like like world, mixing their ideology and allowing that uh, sinful, wrong, uh, false ideology to penetrate their minds. Lord, we ask you for revival among people. And let it be not just emotional revival, let it be revival by the truth. That your Holy Spirit would bring your truth into minds of many people who call themselves believers. That they would be able to believe and have convictions and stand strong. Understanding that this is, this is the purpose why you are leaving us here on earth. That we would be able to be light and salt for, for the people around us. And Lord, we ask your special mercy for our country. For every individual. You see, Lord, those people who are perverted in their thinking. Save them, Lord. Help them to come to understanding that you are the only God, not they. Help them to recognize your power, your right, your goodness, and your great love which has been expressed through your Son, Jesus Christ. We come to you, Lord, and we ask all of that in the powerful name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen.